asked yes. Okay, so let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for all the wonderful blessings that you have given to us, the gift of faith. Help us to realize that our connection to you is based on the forgiveness of sins so that we receive forgiveness, but also help us to realize that we confess our sins to you and not to be afraid of that because that is uh, what Christianity is all about. You have repaired the relationship between humanity and God because the atoning work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So help us to always remember that, especially as we continue our, our dive into the book of Revelation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Okay, so we're still in the section about the commissioning of John. And I need to bring this uh, section up. It started in verse 9. Uh, we finished with verse 16 last week. Um, but now we're going to get to the, the hands-on, so to speak. Pardon the pun. Uh, but that's exactly what verse 17 describes. So chapter 1, verse 17. When I saw him... I fell at his feet as though dead. Okay, and what was uh, Saint John seeing? Saint John was seeing Christ. Okay, mm -hmm. and what is the typical reaction of people whenever they've seen an angel? They're afraid. They're afraid. Right. They 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 see God. They realize this is just not an ordinary human being. You're now seeing Christ in his full glory. But he laid his right hand on me. Ooh, is the right hand important? Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes. For the ordination, it's typically when hands are laid, it could be multiple hands, otherwise it would be a right hand. So uh, here's an interesting thing. So I'm left-handed. <laughs> it gets me into trouble liturgically from time to time. The reason why? is whenever the pastor is supposed to bestow a blessing upon people, he's supposed to use the right hand. Okay? But my natural thoughts is always grab my left hand. Um, Can I make a comment about that? Sure. The Italians use the right hand as a, a negative. Uh, I, I mean, the left hand is a negative. It's a manu manga. That means the, 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 the wrong hand or the the opposite it doesn't mean opposite, it means the wrong hand. So you're saying I'm wrong handed. <laughs> That's okay, John, we still love you. And we still forgive you. Okay. But but to realize something special is happening here. Okay. That now we have the right hand of God. Oh, who's sitting at the right hand of God? Well, that's Jesus, yeah, and that's who's doing this uh, commissioning right here. Uh, he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Okay, so now last week we got into an interesting discussion about Jesus being the firstborn of the dead. I don't know if you remember that from last week. Maybe? Maybe not? Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, but now here he spells it out a little bit more because there was some challenge, uh, as I mentioned, that firstborn of the dead, speaking of Jesus. You know, Lazarus was raised from the dead, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the challenge was, how can Jesus be the first one uh, uh, to sort of rise from the dead? Uh, and the firstborn, and actually it says firstborn of the dead. Um, and so how can that be when there were other people, even in the Old Testament, who died and by God's miracle was raised? And the answer to that is, did they not die again? Sure. And then mm -hmm. they're waiting for the last day. So notice what Jesus says. Uh, uh, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died and behold, I am alive, here's the key word, forevermore. They all died again. And I know last week we were talking about uh, the saints uh, at the, the crucifixion and the tombs opening up and then they were wandering the streets of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. What happened to them? And the answer is we don't know. But we do know this of Christ, 
He died and is alive forevermore. He's not going to die again. Okay? Uh, he is eternal. Okay? Uh, he died once. That was all that was needed. Now, the last point of this is, he says, I have the keys of death and Hades. Okay? So, okay, that, that's a good thing to have. You know, you're the one that you could say you're the jailer of death and Hades. Okay, fair enough. Uh, we talk about uh, at the crucifixion event, uh, when Jesus was crucified, uh, he died, was buried, and as the creed outlines, he descended into hell to proclaim himself victor over the, uh, the people there, uh, and then right. ascended into heaven. Okay, But you, a lot of people would sit there and think, well, shouldn't he have the keys of heaven? Okay, Why would he have the keys of hell? Well, you could call him sort of like the jailer, so to speak, the one that... Uh, on the last day, there will be that judgment with dividing the sheep and the goats, and some will go to heaven, some will go to hell. But the keys of heaven are really kind of given to somebody else. In John chapter 20, verse 22 through 23. Um, and when he had said this, he breathed on them, referring to Jesus, and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. In one essence, the keys of, and in the small catechism, we talk about the office of the keys. The keys of heaven, in one essence, are given to the church. Church is given the power to forgive sins. How else do you get to heaven? The forgiveness of sins. Okay, that's what creates that relationship between us and Christ. Okay, so we need that forgiveness of sins. And so the church has that office of the keys to forgive sins and to withhold sins but then who's the actual on the last day who's going to be doing that judgment that final divide that separation between the sheep and the goats well that's God okay so yes you could say he's got the keys of death and Hades the church really probably has the keys of heaven uh, so that's why the church has that mandate to continue to proclaim that gospel message, to continue to proclaim what Christ has done, has forgiven you all your sins. Okay. And so, this is the message of the church. This is what we should be doing. Okay. So, this is the commissioning of, of uh, John at this point. Okay. When we are going back to uh, verse 17 and 18. Um, uh, he laid his right hand on me. He said who he was. Okay, and then let's go into 19. Now here is the command. Write therefore the things that you have seen and those that are and those that are to take place after this. He's going to see an awful lot. But his commission is to do what? Write these down. Okay. Write these down. Because these words need to go out. <clears throat> That's what John is supposed to do. Um, let's go on to verse 20. Uh, As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand. Here's one of the rare opportunities that God is actually going to kind of spell this out for us. Okay. And the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Uh, so there's a little bit of a flashback. He points John back to the past, and that's a few verses where we ended last week. Uh, verse 16, in his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Okay, what about the angels? Uh, I'm, I bring in a little snippet from Luther's works here. <laughs> Luther writes, Whenever the gospel arises, therefore, the factions and sects must follow to spoil it and put it down. The reason is that the devil must sow his seed among the good seed. And wherever God builds a church, he, referring to Satan, builds his chapel. 
or tabernacle, I'm sorry, uh, wherever God, uh, I'm sorry, let me read this. And wherever God builds a church, he builds his chapel and tabernacle next to it. Satan always wants to be in the midst of the children of God, as scripture says. So, today we, the church celebrates St. Michael and All Angels Day. We remember that God not only gave us his word, okay, sends his Holy Spirit to to keep us in this faith and to guide us in this faith but he also uses his angels to protect us why because there's a war going on right now there is a battle there is a conflict okay <clears throat> you have satan trying to disrupt god's uh word being proclaimed to the nations okay so here at peace lutheran church if i pick up luther's words here you can kind of imagine somewhere around us somewhere there's got to be some little uh, space for a chapel for the devil, so to speak. I know, it's like, okay, I'm not seeing it. Okay, fair enough. But let's just put it this way. We are a target. The more we are faithful to God's word, the more we are a target. The more you confess Christ, the more you are a target. So if you don't want to be a target, then deny Christ. Not that I'm recommending that. Please don't. <laughs> Hang on to Christ because that is your salvation. Okay. So I don't want you to sit there and think, hey, now that I'm a Christian, everything's just going to be perfect. No, we're going to have trials. We're going to have tribulations. Why? Because as soon as you are baptized, this is what I teach my junior high confirmands, as soon as you are baptized, you are now a target for Satan. Okay. So do we need getting back to uh, verse 20 here. Uh, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Do I need God to send messengers for churches? Yes. yes. Do I need God to send messengers, angels for us as Christians? The answer is yes. We have the Holy Spirit. God sends his angels to protect us. Does that mean my life is going to be perfect without any trial or tribulation? The answer is no. We're still going to be doing, uh, be under trials and tribulation. And you might be sitting there going, if God is sending us all these resources, why are we not living the perfect life now? And the answer is, who's more powerful? The answer is Christ. Because Christ is no more powerful, he will allow certain things to come into our life. But at the same time, he also has us in the palm of our hands. He also protects us. And in the Christian faith, we have to realize that even when trials and tribulations come into our lives because of Satan's attacks, that God is more powerful. And so we learn and we can grow in the Christian faith by these trials and tribulations. Wow. Satan doesn't realize that as he's giving us more trials and tribulations, for the Christian, we can grow stronger in our faith and trust in Christ. That's the Christian goal. Satan, of course, always has the idea that maybe he can try to tri trip us up. And unfortunately, sometimes Christians do get tripped up and fall away. And so there's an ongoing battle through all of this. So hang on to this battle because we're going to move into chapter 2. Uh, but in the midst of this battle, always realize something. God is stronger than Satan. We talked about this a little bit last week when I said, can Satan read your mind? And the answer is, God knows all things. Satan does not. Okay? Yes, we were, as we were talking about this, Satan can see the experiences of humanity and see tons of patterns. Okay? And can adjust his strategy accordingly. But Satan is not God. He is not all-powerful. There is an all-powerful God. So as we dive into chapter 2, uh, we're still under this concept of the introduction. Okay, we have not gotten to the prophetic messages. Okay, and for this introduction, we're getting to the last section of it, which is the letters of preparation to the seven churches. So, what... We already got a little bit of this introduction. John's here, okay? And we find out that 
there's going to there's a, a struggle here between Christianity and uh, Satan. Okay, so let's pick up uh, his uh, first letter, uh, Revelation chapter uh, two one through seven. The angel to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Right now, that just might throw us a little off guard. That these letters are going to be written to angels of the church in Ephesus. You might be thinking, shouldn't it be to the people in the church of Ephesus? Mm -hmm. uh, who's doing the work of protecting? <laughs> okay. But are the people also going to be hearing this? The answer yes. is yes. Okay. Um, the words of him, referring to Jesus, who holds the seven stars in his right hand, okay, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, who which I also hate. And uh, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So let me just quick, kind of quickly break this letter apart in a pattern that Brighton does as a comparison between all the other uh, letters. It discusses the um, location, uh, if he, um, Ephesus, uh, chapter 2, 1 through 7. Uh, local details, they were dealing with uh, false apostles uh, and, and Nicolaitans. Uh, and they, so they had to deal with people who were distorting the gospel. Okay. Um, are, is that a difficult to read? No, what's a Nicolaitan? It is uh, uh, one of the many sects that were trying to uh, distract people from Christ. Oh. Okay. Um, and so it was uh, pulling people away from Christ and on a false path. you got to remember when Christianity was first started, as it was progressing, there were many various uh, heresies that would come up. And the reason why is they had to struggle with certain issues. Uh, and they would have to develop a little bit more training in studying the scriptures and to hear the words of God and to study them to get on the correct path. Uh, even today, the church is constantly being challenged by sex and heresies. Okay, So um, it's an ongoing struggle. That's one of Satan's favorite things to do is uh, as uh, Satan tempted Eve, did God really say? And then uh, people fall into those temptations. This is just going to be one of them. Um, but, okay, let's, let's move on a little bit. Uh, the image of Christ uh, holds seven stars in his hands and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Okay, that's the image of Christ in this letter. Uh, Christ sees good, as Brighton notes, that they have endurance, they cannot bear evil people, are not weary, hate the works, okay, of those that are pulling them away from Christ. But they're, Christ sees the bad. What's their bad? They've lost, left your first love. So what's the first love? God. 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 Your faith. You lost, you start losing faith. Yeah. And you're sitting there thinking, wait, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you're able to articulate false apostles from correct ones, but you lost the faith. Wow. 
So, you know, just as somebody can dissect it and say, here's scripture, here's what scripture says, this is the correct path of scripture, this is the wrong path of scripture, but now do you believe it? And it may sound kind of strange to us that, wait a minute, they, they don't believe? Well, let's continue on. Call to repent. Repent. Do uh, uh, first uh, works, or else I will remove your lampstand. So what's the whole call of repentance? Is basically, do you, are you willing to admit you are a sinner? You see, we'll find ourselves in a world even today where we will see many people who say, Oh, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Do you confess your sins? Oh, no. Really? And so that's why even in our liturgy, what's the number one thing? You got your opening hymn, okay? You got your invocation. This is the Triune God. And then we move into what? Confession. And when you have immediate confession, what, what happens immediately after confession? You have absolution. Yes. So you never want to divide confession and absolution. They always go together. As soon as confession is made, there is absolution. Okay, and this is at the beginning part of the liturgy for a reason. This is, helps us in our preparation and our connection with God. This is the Christian faith. How do we come to Christ? Christ calls us. How can we stand in the presence of Christ? We cannot, because we're sinners. But Christ atones for our sins. Notice again that whole concept of confession and absolution. Can you find churches in today's world that actually don't want to talk about sins? Yeah. And don't want to talk about the need for confession and absolution? Unfortunately, yes. But if you ask them, are you a Christian? They're going to say, of course. I think they need to reread chapter 2 of Revelation and start asking some serious questions with this first letter. What's going on here? So notice the promise to the one who conquers. So an obstacle is placed in front of them. Do they confess? And notice the answer. I will grant to eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. Okay, I want to bring in another section of scripture just to kind of reaffirm what's going on here. Uh, my favorite passages to use of this one is going to be Psalm 51. Okay, uh, starting with verse 3. Uh, the psalmist writes, For I know my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Okay, so notice what's going on in here is an acknowledgement. I'm a sinner. Okay. And then goes on to say, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Yeah, we can sin against other people, but ultimately when we sin against other people, who are we really sinning against? God. God. Okay. And you have a quick acknowledgement so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. So the psalmist sits there and says, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Okay, so if you send me to hell, it's, it's appropriate. But there's going to be atonement, which the psalmist uh, uh, has, does not quite yet realize is going to be fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Okay, uh, For those of you who went to the early service and you already got a hold of that gospel reading for today, and the rich man in Hades okay, from uh, Luke chapter 16, uh, what didn't he quite understand? He was the problem. Okay. Again, somebody who considered themselves to be a child of Abraham, people of God language here, didn't understand their sinfulness. Okay. But the psalmist here says, uh, understands here. Uh, I'm going to cut verse to verse 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I love verse 11. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Just a beautiful song. <clears throat> yeah. And, and so it, it, some people may sit there and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this fair? Can God take his Holy Spirit from me? Yes. Yeah. 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 If you're sitting there rejecting God, and what does that rejection look like? Uh, not acknowledging verses 3 and 4. 
you're not realizing you're a sinner in need of God's grace? I mean, isn't this is what this whole relationship is about? And the answer is yes. Can God sit there and say, fine, that free gift of faith, we're just going to pull it, pull the plug on it. You don't want it. You have rejected it. That's how you get to this point. Yes. So Russ. that kind of flies in the face of some religions where they say you cannot lose your faith once you get it then? Correct. There's okay. actually some Christian denominations that will talk about once you are saved, you're always saved and you cannot lose it. However, if you go to the parable of, uh, that Jesus tells of the sower and the seed, okay, and talks about the, the couple of the seeds, uh, one falls on the rocky ground, okay, is gobbled up, uh, one, uh, like in the sandy sh uh, shore, doesn't have a strong root and is withered away, and so forth down the line, that gives you the idea that, hey, these seeds sprouted, they grew, they died. In relation to faith, they had faith, but they fell away. So that's why we are not one of those churches that sits there and says, once you're saved, you're always saved. Okay? Uh, and so what do those churches do when, you know, one in their midst falls away, so to speak? They, they struggle. And, but yet they come up with this conclusion with the idea that, well, maybe they never really believed. <laughs> wow! I, I don't think that's very, very fair. They once did believe. They confessed that. And when you come up with that type of idea, what you do is you are entering doubt into people's minds. Yeah. And that's the mm -hmm. one thing Christ never wants you to have. He wants you to be assured of his generosity. He wants to be, you to be assured of your salvation. This is why Luther uses the phrase, you are saints. You are guaranteed your place in heaven because of what Christ has done, even though you're still sinners here on earth. And uses that saint-sinner concept. Uh, it's not like if you're strong enough or whatever. No, you are saints. Here and now, this is God's grace. Believe and trust in it. Okay? Don't have any doubt. Okay? So, but can this faith be taken away? Or maybe a better way of putting it is, can you reject this faith? And the answer is yes. So the psalmist, let me grab the last two verses here. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Okay, which is great. Okay, you know, give, keep me connected here. Is there a response of a Christian who understands confession and absolution, who is connected to Christ, they realize they're a sinner. They realize they're in need of God's grace. The response is yes. I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Notice the response is yes, I'm going to reach out to sinners and show them the mercies that God has extended to me. That's what the church is all about. But unfortunately, I'm getting on my uh, soapbox here. Many churches in today's world don't want to talk about sin. They don't want to talk about confession. They don't want to talk about absolution because sin makes us feel uncomfortable. But yet, is the fact that I'm a, a forgiven sinner that gives me the comfort of Christ. It also <laughs> talks about being a witness for Christ yes. and an evangelist for Christ. So. Even God gives, like freely, freely I give, freely, freely you receive. Um, God doesn't want it to just stay within us. Correct. He wants us to that's, share with others. That's where verse 13 comes in. There's a response to this confession and absolution and part of this, this being in the faith. And the response is, yes, I'm going to teach. Yes, I'm going to be that, that witness. I'm going to teach transgressors, specifically sinners, and sinners. Again, the whole emphasis of sinners will return to you. But in today's world, you know, they, they just don't really want to hear that word. Okay, uh, but l let's move on now to, or any other questions, Russ? I question. I'm a little confused because in the beginning of chapter two, it starts, it's, it's written to the angel right. of the first church. But yet everything we've been talking about kind of relates to us as people. Does the angel lose its faith? Like yeah. what we're talking about? No, the, the angel is um, uh, sealed. 
But why is the letter written to the angel that every discussion you've had since has been about us as people losing our faith and being, I mean, why wasn't it written to the people as opposed to the angel, I guess is my question. I, I'm going to go out on a limb on this one. Okay. So this is a Balaism. This isn't necessarily a Brightonism, okay? Uh -huh. The, the, the role of the angels for the churches was to protect the churches. Right. In today's world, who protects the churches? I'm going to say, yes, there are angels out there protecting the churches. Pastors. Yes. Ah, okay. your mm -hmm. pastors and teachers then that are that proclaiming God's word. Hmm? Earlier, the lesson in Timothy talking about the overseers and the deacons. That's, that's yes. another beautiful reason why that passage okay. could also gotcha. be connected into our whole theme. Uh, uh, for that uh, that aspect is that um, and, th and that's why I struggled with today's readings I mean yes I love st. Michael's and all angels and it fits in well with especially as you're going through Revelation but yet so were the regular readings the church <clears throat> and you know bottom line to his scripture interpret scripture it's all related so it's all good but yeah so I was kind of struggling with all of that but uh, to again to get to that concept is that God uses his word to feed us to give us that faith, to strengthen us in that faith, uh, and to protect us in that faith. And so that word is given, so whenever that word is proclaimed, whoever's doing that teaching is really kind of that protector in getting God's word. Not that I individually am some gladiator or something, or superhero, okay? Uh, I don't think Marvel or DC would ever make a superhero <laughs> pastor, okay? <laughs> And besides, it's not my physical flesh and blood, but it is the power of God's Word. And that was actually, we saw a nuance of that in verse 16. Okay, I don't think I have that on my slide, so those that you have your, your Bible, you can go back to that. Uh, where out of his mouth is that sharp two-edged sword, which is a reference to God's Word. So, okay, Russ, did that kind of answer your questions? Are we putting you on yeah, the right I think path? So. Okay, yeah. so you're right. It is. It sounds a little strange that it's yeah. writing to angels, and wouldn't you think that angels would know God's will? Okay, um, you could interpret this as, uh, and I don't even want to go there yet uh, because of the whole time issue. Uh, but let's just say it, the the angels, the wills are already fixed. Okay, that the war has already taken place. Even though we're going to pick that up in chapter twelve. Okay, um, that we're going to talk about that as a flashback. Uh, so. Um, but again, uh, who is protecting the church? Maybe that's the better way that that should have been uh, focused in, uh, and instead of um, uh, the angels. But I'm not going to disagree with how St. John wrote it. No. Okay, question. Um, Revelation is full of symbolism. Yes, it and is. And I think that the angels here is a, it's, it's a symbolism of, at least my book says that an angel in verse 1 is the elder or pastor from the church. So the angel is like a symbol, mm -hmm. meaning oh, okay. the, the heads gotcha. of the church. Okay. Yeah, and, and, but I'm, I'm, I'm just going to I'm just going to want to tweak that just a little bit. I'm agreeing with you, okay? And uh, who are proclaiming God's word? Because really, the power is God's word. Because I'm, I'm also having in the back of my mind, not everyone who claims to be a pastor is really wielding God's word. Unfortunately, I really wish they would. Uh, and I wish more churches would continue to proclaim Christ, but they don't. Okay, let's go on to the... Oh, yeah, question. Once, once again, at that time, they knew angels, because angels came, they were the messenger of God. So when he wrote to the... As the angels, they knew this was our messenger mm -hmm. from God. And, and who is your messenger of God, so to speak, here at Peace? Pastor. Yeah. The pastor. Yeah. Right. Okay. As long as the pastor continues to proclaim God's word. But if the pastor starts preaching his own message, or a message that is apart from Christ, now we get ourselves into problems. Okay, uh, let's go on to the second letter. Uh, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say they are Jews, but are not, but are, of, but are a synagogue of Satan. 
Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to uh, throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Okay, so uh, just as we were just struggling with who this letter was to be written to, verse 11 says, you know, Here, he who has got an ear, let him hear to what the Spirit says to the churches. So you get a little bit of that nuance in there, okay? But as this is continuing to build, we continue to learn a little bit more. So let's unpack this letter uh, to Smyrna. Uh, the particular issue here, synagogue of Satan is there. Ooh, and that's kind of a reference to the Jewish, a Jewish nuance that maybe might not be completely accepting Christ. Um, the first and the last who was dead and came back to life. That's the image of Christ there. Okay. Uh, Christ sees good. I know your suffering and poverty. But Christ also sees the bad. Are afraid to suffer. Well, okay, you can put me that in, put me yeah. in that category also, okay? <laughs> and, you know, um, if suffering has to come, okay, fair enough. Uh, but I, I don't pray every day that says, Lord, send me some suffering. I can't wait. <laughs> okay, you, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. How many times as Christians have we ever said, Lord, increase my faith? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How does the Lord increase your faith? Sometimes through suffering. <laughs> It's uh, sometimes through trials and tribulations and sufferings. You're right. And so now you're, everyone's going to sit there and say, Lord, please weaken my faith. Weaken my faith. Give me a weak faith. Let me just be there on the edge. And the answer is no. There's going to be trials and sufferings. But don't worry. Don't worry. Christ will carry you through all of this. And that's what Revelation is all about. There are going to be trials. There are going to be tribulations. But we also hear that we're going to hear the beautiful news. You're not alone. Christ is with you. What we don't want is denial. We don't want people to sit there and say, there is no Satan. Okay? We don't want people to sit there and say, there's going to be no more trials or tribulations. We don't want people to sit there and say, God is punishing me for some reason. This is why something has been allowed to happen in my life. Okay? Uh, but instead, we trust in Christ's deliverance, his forgiveness, and he will continue to be there no matter what we see around us. Okay? Uh, so there's a call to repentance. Stop being afraid of com the, the coming suffering. Poverty. Be uh, faithful to death, and I will give you the crown of life. Okay? So that's part of that repentance. Stop being afraid. Okay? Continue to trust God. But yet, how often are we quick to worry? Okay? So, you know, our head hits the pillow at night, and what? Our worries start coming forward? I know we're all guilty of the same thing. But again, do we not believe we worship the Almighty God? Then why are we worried? That's my sinful human flesh that's worried. Yeah, John? Weak. I just got to say this. <laughs> I know you Old age is not for sissies. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> As we are, are afraid of suffering. Okay. We do it. Endurance. That's what uh, we live by. Yep. Got it. Okay, and, and so you're saying as you get older, it gets more and more challenging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the golden years aren't always golden. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> sure they are. It's just that we're used to suffering and we don't, don't, we don't think about it. Right, Bob? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so there's a, call to, there's a call to repentance, huh? Excuse me. I will keep in my mind, I will not give you more than you can handle. <laughs> okay. Uh, and... You know, the as we take a look at God's grace, God is not going to leave you, nor is he going to forsake you. He walks okay. us through the fire. And that's where you come up with the, the psalmist in Psalm uh, the 23, so, uh, the third psalm that some of us have me uh, memorized. Yeah. Yea, though I walk through the valley, the valley of the shadow of death. We're not taking the detour. Uh, we're not taking the scenic route. 
We're going through the valley of shadow of death. But how's that finish? Fear no evil. Fear no evil. I will fear no evil for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Wow. God's already laid out this. You know, just for, you just have to remember the Psalms, remember your Old Testament and so forth down the line. And so you have that promise. You will not be hurt. You will not be hurt by the second, the second death. It's not going to bother you. Yes, you might have to suffer physically in this world. Yes, you might experience physical pain. Yes, there might be other different types of torment and tortures. But the ultimate pain of the second death will not hurt you. You are protected because of Christ. What's the first death? Uh, the physical death of our bodies. So somewhere in between, we're, we're somewhere in between there after we leave this earth, we're somewhere else and then we, God has the final judgment where he separates the goats from the sheep and once some go to hell, some go to heaven. Um, that, that's a little, not quite on the same level, but I'm not going to necessarily disagree with what you said. Uh, let me just re, let me try to pick up uh, the path that I want to go. Uh, there's a, a, a cliche that's out there in uh, Christian's worlds that says, uh, if you were born once, you die twice. If you were born twice, you die once. Born once is a physical birth. You will die twice physically and spiritually. If you're born twice, you're physical and you're spiritual through holy baptism, you will only physically die once. So that's why if you were born once, you die twice. If you were born twice, you die once. That's probably picking us back onto uh, this path here. You will not be hurt by that second death. Okay, let's go on to the next letter. Uh, and to the angel of the church in Pergamum, Right, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who has who was killed among you where Satan dwells, but. I have a few things against you. You have uh, some who, there who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught uh, Balak uh, to put uh, a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Okay, there is a lot going on in here, and I'm not going to unpack all of it, so my apologies. Okay. Uh, and there's a lot we don't know. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's first unpack what we do know. Uh, written to the church in Pergama, uh, the local detail, the problem there is Satan's throne is there. Satan lives there. There was a martyr that um, uh, somehow uh, Antipas uh, died, and we don't have all the details for that. And again, you have uh, false heresies being taught. Well, obviously, if Satan's throne is there, the, the gospel is going to be struggling, and there's going to be a lot of things going. Uh, the image of Christ for these people has the two-edged sword. What's that two-edged sword? God's Word. God's Word. Okay. Okay, so Christ sees good that you know they hold they held on to the name. They did not deny the faith, even in the midst of martyrdom. Okay, but God sees some bad. They still hold to the teachings of Balaam, the idolatry, the immorality. Okay, and so you know it kind of begs the 
the, the question, is there anything, is there such a perfect Christian no. that has it all right and all together? No. No, because if you were the perfect Christian, you would have no need for confession and absolution. But that is your means of being in the Christian faith. Okay, so yes, as Christians, we are sinners, okay? And that is what God's Word does. I'm um, hoping you've heard this phrase before when we talk about God's Word. We talk about God's Word being applied to us in law and gospel, mm -hmm. okay? The law shows us our sins, okay? So that we realize we're a sinner, which prepares us for the gospel that shows us our salvation in Christ Jesus. But if I put a Savior out in front of you and you don't realize your sins, what good is that Savior? No good. No good. Unless if you have a different type of God that says, I, the God will just give me wealth and money. Okay. More wives. Huh? <laughs> More wives. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's one way of putting it. Okay, but anyway. But Scripture presents itself in law and gospel, where the law convicts us of our sins to prepare us to receive that gospel of Jesus Christ. So, um, a call to repent. Repent. Else I war with the sword of my mouth. Can you war with the war of mm -hmm. word of God? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Jesus did it at the temptation. Yeah, there, there's always, uh, well there, yeah, at the temptation, God, uh, Jesus used God's word to ward off uh, Satan. Satan. Right. Uh, and... Uh, but for the, the Christian, uh, as we take a look at God's word of law, we may not always be comfortable with that. But we need that law because that law serves the gospel. And so sometimes Christians do struggle with that law. Okay? Uh, you know, for example, you could always start re reading Psalm chapter 1 and then you sit there and go, how can your, your delight be in the law of God and to the Torah of God? And when you understand that the law serves the gospel, then you sit there and say, you're right, when I'm reminded of my sins, I realize that, yes, I deserve to die, but thanks be to God, who sends his son Jesus to atone for my sin so I don't get what I deserve, but I have the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. That's the pathway of Christianity. Okay, promise to the one who conquers. I will give the hidden manna and a white stone and a secret name. Oh, 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 okay. Again, I, I don't want to start uh, real, I will get really sidetracked. Um, but I want you to hear these words and to realize what God is going to give you is to help you with these struggles. And he's really going to give us his word. And that's where his word comes with law and gospel. Uh, hidden manna, you know, you can talk about the food of life. Is God's word the food by which we need? The answer is yes. And whenever I start thinking of food and God's word, of course, you know, my mind is always going to go back to Ice the cream. Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. <laughs> okay. Uh, the white stone. Uh, we're going to struggle with that one. And a secret name. Well, well, let's put it this way. If you're not trusting and believing in God's Word, even though God's Word is being revealed to you as you read it, but if you don't believe it, then it becomes a closed book for you. There are many atheists that will read the Bible from cover <coughs> to cover and still say, I don't believe. But yet, the Christian can read God's Word and find comfort in that Word. Okay, so let, let's go on to the next one. Um, I think we have time to uh, cover this one. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, uh, 18 through 29. And to the church, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patience endurance and that 
Uh, your latter works exceed the first, but I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman uh, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to <coughs> repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into the great tribulation, unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works, but to the rest of you in Thyatira, Thyatira uh, who do not hold uh, this teaching, you have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. I say uh, to you, I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast to what you have, to what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my word until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a iron, iron rod, rod of iron. And I, and as uh, earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have authority, uh, received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And again, there's tons to unpack here. Okay. But uh, quickly, let me just uh, go to uh, the outline here. Uh, the local detail. The so-called prophetess Jezebel is there. Some there have known uh, the depths of Satan. Okay? And that's seen by their works. Okay? Uh, by some of the things that they do. Okay? The image of Christ. The sons of God... Uh, who has eyes like fire and feet like bronze. This brings up many images of God uh, in uh, the scripture like this. Okay, uh, Searches uh, thoughts and hearts. And again, that was part of that discussion last week when I said, Satan does not know your thoughts and your hearts, but God does. God knows every single sin that has crossed your mind and you entertained it. Okay, but he still loves you and forgives you. And again, this is a message really of reconciliation and forgiveness. Okay, uh, so what does Christ see as good? Uh, they have love, faith, service, endurance. Uh, your last works are more than your first works. So, you know, they're doing good things here. However, sees the bad. They tolerate the so-called prophetess Jezebel who teaches people to commit sexual immorality and eat idolatrous foods, okay? So there's a call to repentance. And again, that's the beautiful thing of God's grace and mercy. We all have sinned. We all have fallen short of God's glory. But when confronted with our sins, what do we do? Do we confess? Those are hard words when we say <laughs> confession, okay? but needful words for that for the Christian, okay? So, a call to repent. Repent of the uh, uh, adultery with Jezebel. Her children will be killed. The faithful must hold fast to what they have learned. When we repent, when we confess our sins, we are forgiven, we are restored. But if we refuse to repent, it's like refusing God's grace. That's why confession and absolution is so important. Promise to the one who uh, conquers, I will give authority to rule the nations with an iron scepter and will give the morning star. Okay. Um, so you can describe this as like uh, the gift of eternal life. Okay. Uh, without, but it also brings many <coughs> images that they would have been familiar with. But if I start unpacking the images, uh, we will be here uh, even longer, but they are there. So, again, if you want to start opening up your Bible and start unpacking the images of where in Scripture do you have that morning star? What does it kind of mean? And so forth down the line. Uh, it, it's there. So, any questions uh, up to this point? Yeah. It's in 2 Peter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, questions, yes. Sharna. Yes, a question. 
So, so back when they're talking, we're talking about um, eating the idolatrous food. Now, you want me to flip back to the previous slide with the text? No, no. no. Okay, it's, just here. It's okay. right there in the. Um, what Christ is, is bad. bad. We're immoral in eating idolatrous food. Well, I mean, Paul does say it doesn't matter. So you can eat it because it's just food. Don't worry about it. Now, in this case, is it because they're not just eating the food, but they're also thinking about why it's there, why it was sacrificed, and kind of leaning towards that? Is that the difference? Um, that is a, a beautiful difference is that you have to believe and trust in Jesus Christ. Paul does talk about food that is sacrificed to idols uh, and that uh, you can go ahead as long as you're not damaging uh, your brother's faith and go ahead and uh, eat this. You don't brag about the idol, you brag, you give thanks to God for uh, the gifts. Okay, uh, But this also could be uh, looked at a little symbolically. Uh, what is food for idolatry? And that is basically practicing idolatry. Sinful actions. Yeah. You're, so your idolatrous actions could almost be considered like food for idolatry. And so it might bring in uh, an actual symbolism of just go that. ahead and practicing that. So, But you are 100% correct when uh, Paul was instructing the Christians uh, about um, uh, meat that was sacrificed to idols, okay? is not to be focusing upon the idol and participating in that sacrifice, but you could buy cheap meat and thank God for that uh, cheap meat and praise and honor God with that. And the answer was yes, that was possible. Uh, but if there were some weaker brothers who uh, were very unsure about that, uh, Paul would say, let's just be careful of that. Uh, but for here, again, I want to then focus on a strong <laughs> confession and absolution. Uh, that in the midst of their idolatry, they would need to confess their sin. Uh, they were not confessing it. They were almost like feeding the idolatry or excusing the idolatry. So let me just bring in a nuance into this, which will get me into hot water with the world around me. Um, do we see churches in today's world that excuse uh, sexual immorality. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Boy, that was kind of a quick response. And families too. <laughs> and we just sort of sit there and go, "Oh, ouch." Okay. Even Lutheran churches, huh? Even Lutheran churches, even, just not, yeah, just not Missouri Synod, hopefully. Um, well, I'm. I'm. All I'm going to say is, considering the nature of the beast. Uh, even probably within the Missouri Synod, we are also made up of sinners and saints. Mm -hmm. But the key is that we confess our sins. Mm -hmm. So in the midst of, let's just say, other churches that excuse the idolatry or the sexual immorality, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. what they're basically saying is, these sins we approve of, you don't have to confess them. Wow. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, that's what they're saying. Yeah. We are going to teach the opposite. We're all sinful. We have many sinful actions. We take our sins and we confess them and bring them to Christ. Does Christ forgive sinners? Yeah. Yes. So to those that excuse sexual immorality, whatever images are coming into your mind, and churches that come into your mind with that, what they're basically saying is, I don't need Christ's forgiveness for this section of my life. I'm good. Be careful. That's a real scary situation. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say, that's probably similar to what's going on here. They're really saying, we don't need Christ's forgiveness in here because we got this section of our life good. We approve of it. It's our stamp of approval. And we're sitting there going, no, no, no. What Christ wants us to do is to constantly come to him and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me because Christ forgives. We should not be afraid of coming to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for forgiveness. Why? Because Christ forgives. Does Christ ever withhold forgiveness? No. Yes. Oh, yeah, but that's oh we had that in our John passage. 
forgive if they confess their sins there's forgiveness but if they don't confess their sins there is no forgiveness now what does that do to a church that says hey we're going to set aside this little area of your life and god's word may call it a sin but we're going to excuse it you don't need to confess it you can see the tension of christianity at that point and that's why in, here in the Missouri Synod, what we should be always doing is to proclaim uh, what the Bible teaches. Marriage between a man and a woman. Okay. Uh, yes, there's forgiveness. Uh, we all sin, we all fall short of God's glory. But we should not get to the point of saying um, that because of whatever sin I think, it doesn't need to be forgiven. No. We bring all our sins to our Lord and Savior. He is gracious and merciful. And we should not fear. We know what the Lord's answer is. When we withhold sins, that's when we really just need to start worrying because then, as the psalmist in Psalm 51 reminds us, could possibly God take away His Holy Spirit from us? Yes. Yes. The answer is yes. Okay, so uh, I think I want to end here at this point. Uh, got through the uh, chapter two. Uh, I know, John, you had a question, right? Well, the purpose of what we're talking about is repentance. Amen. If there is no repentance, what are we talking about? Well, just forgiving your sins isn't enough, I think. He's saying you have to actually ask for forgiveness. I mean, I've been with that all my life. And uh, yeah. uh, practicing what we preach is, is all part of. Exactly. Of, of, but that's if you under, you go to a church that teaches and understands sin, okay, and the need for forgiveness. But there are many churches, unfortunately, that don't want to teach sin and don't want to teach that we're sinners, and so henceforth, you're also not teaching forgiveness. And I think that's where your your kind of question is coming to. And as we struggle with this, we're going, how can churches do that? And that's because we're in a community that teaches law and gospel. We are sinners in need of God's grace. And as we confess our sins, uh, we come before our Lord and we say, Lord, have mercy. The Lord is great and rich. So in are you mercy. a sinner if the church that you came from and if your parents taught you that it wasn't a sin and you were raised to believe that, then are you actually sinning because you're only following what you were taught? But that's not the truth. We all yeah, have sinned. Yeah, yeah. Right. But you're a child, you don't know that. And that's what you were raised with and believed to be okay. And you go to church and your pastor teaches that. Then are you truly sinning because you don't really know any better? Because well, wouldn't you be a born again Christian then? If you're oh, okay, hold on a second. Wait, wait. A, I'm running out of time. The B, the quick answer is there's a natural knowledge of God within us. Okay, we covered that off in Romans. Uh, and uh, no one is excused. We're all sinners in need of God's grace. Um, and so, but that's down a path that I don't want to go because right now that's not where the book of Revelation is leading us. I'm really running out of time here. So we're going to close with the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.